name's Josh, and um, I'm in a band called Post Human with my cousin, who is the silent half of the band. I've been running a record label called Bulk and Vinyl and a club night called Isle of Acid for the last few years, but I've been here in East London for about 20 years now, putting on club nights and running record labels and releasing records and losing money and getting drunk and going home crying and all of those things that the music business brings you. Since 1999, my passion has always been about doing things a little bit weirder and a little bit more interesting. I like doing collectible stuff and I like doing kind of high quality, unique things. That's kind of been to the detriment sometimes because it's, it means it's a lot more work and particularly if you do things very limited, you have less scope for making profit, but it's a good way of standing out, of doing something interesting. It's nice to, to, to have something unique and you do end up getting a good following. I have a couple of record labels at the moment. The I Love Acid record label, which is linked to the I Love Acid Club Night, was a really simple concept. 303 copies on vinyl, no digital, no repressing, just hand stamped and hand numbered so everybody knows how limited they are. They know that each one has been done individually and unique. And I started that in 2014, so about five years ago now, and honestly didn't know whether it was going to take off or not, whether it would be particularly popular, but I had a lot of mates that were writing really cool acid tracks. It's named after a track by a mate of mine called Luke Vibert, who also has released on the label a few times and played for me God knows how many times. By not budging from that simple concept, even when it started becoming more successful, really created a, a very loyal audience. But I also would really participate with the audience as well. I will always, I do a lot of my sales direct. I always email the people directly and I give people advance notice about what I'm doing. I send little handwritten messages to people. I give extras, stickers, logos, bits and pieces. I always try and do something so there's a little bit more of a personal connection. It's now at the point where when I release one of these records it will normally sell out in about an hour. So it's, you know, it's, it's done really well. However, the problem is, is that it's based on the number 303 and 300 records is essentially your break-even point. So there's a, like, it's a no-profit record label. Why, why do you not just do digital alongside that, just so there's some cumulative passive... Because the, the original concept was 303 on vinyl, with no digital, didn't... And could you not, like, could that, as a concept, just retain, but just for no, the digital... No, no. If you change up what you're doing, just because it starts getting more popular, then people are going to know that that stinks. Mm. You know, then people are going to go, well, that's not, that's not what you were about. I can do, I do other things that can make money. I do other digital releases with the other label and I did a digital release as a, a collection for the label, like a, a, a special edition, but when you remain true to your core and you do that, people will respect you more for it. So you're putting releases out by other... Other artists, stuff, yep. It, but is it, uh, uh, you know, like a time frame sort of thing, so like after a number of years they can re-release it or anything like that? Or? No. no, everybody that's on the label knows what the label's about. They know that it's that one time, one thing, 303 copies, that's it. And if they don't want to do that, then they, 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 you know, they can be on the other label, they can be on bulk, in which I do do digital and I do repress when things sell out. But it's not just about tangible profit. A lot of the projects that I do don't make any money. A lot of them lose money, but they all feed into the central brand. They all feed into the central idea. Everything then comes through to that, and then there'll be something that then has an option to make some money, and that's where the money comes from. For me, mostly, I make a living off gigging, off DJing. I've done um, 45 weekends this year, so 45 out of 52 weekends I've been on the road DJing, and that's generally my income that then pays my mortgage and pays my bills. And most of the label stuff, most of the parties, most of the projects run at a loss. Some of them will make, make some money, make some will make it, but they all feed into the brand. They all become part of that amalgam thing. And I wouldn't be getting the gigs if I wasn't doing all of the other interesting stuff. The exclusivity of the, of the short runs as well gives more appeal for people to come and hear you playing it live or listen to the podcast on the radio show. Yeah, well, um, well, you see, on top of this, I also do a radio show which is related to the label, which the idea of the show is I only play brand new stuff from all sorts of people and I go off the promo list, I go digging digitally on SoundCloud and Bandcamp to find people that no one's heard of, you know, try to bring that all in. It's a lot of work, but it's definitely worth it. The funny thing is, is that every time I do have a, a record sell out, then I get a bunch of angry emails from people. 
saying, why don't you do digital? I want this, I need this. When I first started buying records, there was no digital. If you couldn't get hold of a record, you couldn't get hold of a record, that was it. Then since, since digital happened, we all suddenly seemed to feel entitled that, oh, well, I like that track, so I should therefore be able to have it the way that I want it for free. I should be able to stream it. And it's a kind of a weird age of entitlement that's happened. And the fact is, is that if there was a painter who did a beautiful painting and then they said, right, I'm going to do 50 high quality framed prints signed you wouldn't kind of email them a load of abuse and go no mate you should fucking give me that as a jpeg for my <laughs> iphone <laughs> wallpaper it's an artist's prerogative to do things yeah. however they want to do it you know you you like having something that you know is special that someone's put some effort into it you know when you get something and it is hand numbered and it's hand stamped and it's sent to you with a little message and some extras that you weren't expecting yeah. it feels you know it's 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 better than just oh i liked that click from you know beatport i've got it now you know, there's, there's not really anything special about that. I can show you a couple of examples of stupid things that I've done. I did a series of rave records called Rave Wars. If you want to have a look at those, they're kind of pastiches of... Um, <laughs> and I sacrificed my own childhood Star Wars figure collection. <laughs> this was from a series of uh, three records. There was Rave Wars, the Hardcore Strikes Back and the um, Return of the Old School because there is only three Star Wars movies. There is only three Star Wars movies. <laughs> and so I did them to make them look a bit like the old so what, how figures. Many did you do? I did 200 of each and, and then... Did you, did you have 200 toys? What happened is I had my own collection of toys and then when I started planning to do these I started going around charity shops looking on eBay and collecting them. And then I found a guy that did the plastic blisters in Spain that uh, did them for people that recard their old action figures and frame them and stuff and I bought a bunch of them of him in bulk and then I literally sat at my um, once I had the records pressed I sat at my table in my house and I was stacking them on the thing putting the figures on gluing them down and then weighing them down with books I sold them for 10 quid each and there was not very much profit in them but they're a cool thing mm. and again it's one of those things that while there was there was so many hours work put into them I wouldn't even like to think what the, <laughs> the what you know the when return per hour. what the return <laughs> per hour would be but it was worth doing because yeah, yeah. it brought a whole load of new people over to the label these are the I love acid records the kind of the stamped and numbered thing they're all the same hand stamped numbered on heavyweight vinyl in nice sleeves. The label's been going since 2014 with the I Love Acid ones and I'm up to number 20 so I guess it's on average five a year and then the other label has hit number 29 and but that's been going a little bit longer and then there's Rave Wars and then I did a little digital series for a while as well so I think that overall I'm probably at about 70 releases and then every every single vinyl release is sold out there's no back stock of anything which is good the most recent project this actually came out today was another new kind of idea because i'm always wanting to do something that's a little bit different try and find a way to stand out what i did with this is i did what i thought was the first randomly colored vinyl when you see coloured records, you'll sometimes see red or blue or green and you'll sometimes see marbled ones. All of these things are the premix of the pellets that they use to then press. So if you've got like a red and yellow and white marbled record, the premix is a, say a red base pellet with white and yellow pellets that they put into the hopper, which is the big tub that then gets melted and pressed into the records. You can't really change what you put into a pressing of a record halfway through a record because if the PVC base of the pellets is slightly different or if the size of the cut is slightly different, they can melt at slightly different speeds. So it can cause crackling and soft points on the records or just like completely fuck the sound quality up. And particularly with the older plants, it was very, very difficult to change what was in the hopper once a pressing was through. You would normally, you know, they'd be running on black and they'd have to completely clean out before they put in new things and then run through all their reds. However, I started working with a, a new pressing plant, whoever, one of the, the, the first new, they've got a brand new warm tone. Yes, the Canadian, this is a Canadian press, although these guys are based in Taiwan. And we looked into a whole different batch of different colored pellets and different colored waxes that had the same melting points and the same cut size and then randomized the pressing. 
So started pressing some black ones and then stopped it and put yellow in and then let the yellow go in on the black and it would start marbling and then they would turn yellow and then put blue in and then the vinyl all went green and continued to do this throughout the pressing for two different records. And what came out, I could probably actually find a couple of photos and stick them up on there. As you can see, the, the records all come out different colors. So the whole pressing throughout the record is completely random. And then I had them all packed randomly. So this record's just gone out now to the shops. I, I put them up for sale a, a couple of weeks ago and I sold all my pre-sales in about four hours and the rest have gone to shops. No one knows what color record they're going to get. I don't even know what color records are gonna be out there. Um, no one knows what color combination the two are going to be. And I put in all my press releases that it's the first time anyone's done this in the world. I've now found out that I'm the second person to have done it. Someone else did it about four months ago, but they didn't do the research into the different sized pellets <laughs> and their record sounds like shit. <laughs> and you can buy their record for about two quid on Discogs and it's not sold out and no shops have got it listed as multicolor because I think they, they did it and they took a couple of photos and it looked great, but it sounds like crap, so no one wants it. I'm still standing by it's the first functional <laughs> random colored record. I've always thought it's a good idea to try and do something unique if you want to stand out, make the extra effort to do something weird, you know, even if it costs you time and money. When I first started out in uh, the first record that I ever did in 2000, we pressed 2000 records and 1000 CDs and then we repressed it twice. These days, to do 300 records is really good. I think it's because there's, there's a lot more records out these days. I know that re vinyl sales are higher, but there's so many more people actually releasing records. There's For every record label that there was in 2000, there's 50 record labels now. There's so much music out there. So even though the, the cake is bigger, there's so many more people at the table. Everyone's ending up with a smaller slice. Struggled yeah. with um, pressing. Yes, massively. I had some issues. I was pressing with MPO, which are one of the, the big pressing plants in France for a while. They were obviously running their presses a little bit hot so that they could run everything through a bit quicker because they had so much stock they were trying to get through. So I had records coming back warped. I had records coming back with bad hole punches in, slightly off center, dirty cuts on the edge of the vinyl, just everything slipshod trying to get things done really quickly. I recently moved to this new pressing plant who are doing stuff on a brand new warm tone press. I really like this, this particular company because they refuse to take any major label contract. They only deal with independent labels. Uh, are the few details of how you are reaching out to a record plant? You know, okay, to if you have music that you're going to put out on a record, first of all, you, you have to have it mastered slightly differently than you would have digital because it's going to obviously be pressed to vinyl and it will then sound slightly different. You have to roll off certain frequencies that can't be picked up. So you need to go and get your music mastered specifically for vinyl. Then what happens with that is it's taken to somewhere and cut to a lacquer. Basically it's like a, it, it will be manually cut, usually on a lathe at one to one speed. You're literally cutting the, the version of your record and that's it's quite a, a soft thick soft platter. You know when you see etchings and stuff on the inside that's all done on this. You can literally get a compass point and scratch in words on it, it's it's that easy to do. You can get one and do, get the, the other side. Actually, it's all done, they're all one-sided, but you can get one that's your second side, not put music on and put drawings on, and that would be pressed if you want. So it's a very soft thing. Now, those lacquers are then sent to someone that will do the galvanics, the metal work. Some pressing plants have metal work places, but some places get them sent off to specific metal work places. For instance, I get my stuff done in a place in Canada called Precision. So I'll get uh, my lacquers cut at Curve Pusher, uh, who are now based in Hastings, and they'll make the lacquer from my music. They'll check the, the audio, make the lacquer. They'll then send that to the galvanic place, who will then make an opposite press of that. So that lacquer is then used to make a metal <coughs> plate, which is then the inverse of it. That metal plate will then be sent to the pressing plant. The pressing plant has the wax in pellet forms, goes into a hopper, it's heated up into uh, little round things about this big called a biscuit. Your two paper labels are put on either side and it's put in the middle of your metal plates, which then literally squish the hot wax, slice off the edges and put it on a cooling rack. And that's your record. So those are your kind of your three parts of the process. The metal work is kind of the most individually expensive bit to do, which is why 
cutting 100 records doesn't cost much less than cutting 500 records because all of the cost is in the actual master, the making of the lacquer and the metalwork. And then you're just paying per unit for the vinyl and the vinyl is obviously going to be cheaper as you do more of them. Your metalwork will last, I mean, depending on how well it's made, but it will last a good few thousand runs. But every time it's taken off the platter and stored and put back for a repress, it can get a bit of dust on it, it can get dirty. So when you get represses, this is why you generally can't get the same record repressed from the same metalwork plates after 18 months because the metalwork has degraded too much. So sometimes if you're going to repress an old record, you have to get new plates made. So that's kind of the process of making a, a record. And when you want to get that done, you'll find there are places that are brokers that will literally look after everything for you. And you'll give them your artwork and your music. They'll look after everything and then they'll get it delivered either to you or to your distributor, whoever's sending the, the records out to the shops. Brokers are generally pretty good to go with because they'll be representing a whole bunch of clients at a time when they go to the pressing plant. So they have the clout of being able to put in a lot of things. So that's why their margins are lower because they're doing lots of pressing. And then if there's a problem, they'll probably already have a relationship with the pressing plant that they can chase down the problem and deal with it. However, they're more expensive. Or you can go direct to a pressing plant yourself you can even do all of the different components separately yourself, which is always cheaper, but then you're having to do much more of the work yourself, and if something goes wrong, you're just one person emailing, you're a small client. So it's, it's a kind of it's a toss-up whether you want to go with a broker that look after things for you, or whether you want to do each thing manually, save money, but then have to be the person on hand dealing with every single issue. How did those come out, the, the ones from the Taiwan? The ones from Taiwan are some of the best quality records that I've had ever. Because it's, it's, a, it's a brand new pressing plant. They're using a, what's called a warm tone press, which is by uh, Viral, I think they're called, uh, so which is a Canadian company. It's the first brand new pressing plants in the world since the 70s. It's like it's, a, it's an old technology. It's an old forgotten technology, the old hydraulic presses. And most of the new pressing plants that you've seen come online in the last few years are literally just old presses that have been refurbed. But the parts aren't made anymore. The tools are gone. The, you know, it's like it's an old lost knowledge. There's, but there was, when there was no new presses, because these warm tones are only been around for about a year and a half now, you had people that were literally going to South America through, through Africa to try and find these old presses in warehouses and bring them back to Europe or bring them back to America to get them back online. So because there were so few presses and the technology was so old and limited, that's what created such a bottleneck in getting records pressed, which is why it got slower and slower and more and more expensive to get them pressed. And particularly then when Record Store Day happened and all the majors started printing fucking Fleet Fleetwood Mac represses mm -hmm. and all that shit, they were jumping the queue ahead of all of the little indie labels who'd kept all the plants alive for 15 years, and it was making it even more difficult. However, the warm tone presses, I think, there's, I think there's about 15 of them now in operation around the world and they're still making more. There's also a couple of new presses in Europe that are uh, refurbed uh, Tulexes, which are the old Swedish plants. They call them Phoenixes and they're new versions of the old press. They're using some old parts, but the main thing is new. But the good thing about these new presses is because it's new technology, it has digital monitors for the, the temperature. It, you know, it, it's, it's much, much more precise and they have uh, multiple cooling racks and they're also much, much smaller. The original pressing plants would take up all of the space in this room, whereas the new ones are about the size of this mixing desk. A company can be operating with much less space, much, much less overheads. One person can literally be operating it and doing the quality control. So yeah, I'm finding the, you know, working with the, the new plant is is really, really good. I mean, my, my I Love Acid records, there's actually 350 of them rather than 303. Because when you get a record pressed, you have an element of overs or unders. You never get your exact amount that you ask for. And it can sometimes be up to like 10, 15%. So if I was just pressing 303 copies, and then they turn up and they go, well, actually, there's only 274 today you'd kind of be a bit fucked. So I always get 350 done. Sometimes it turns up 320, 330. I've had a couple of them that turned up like 360, 365. They all get hand numbered. That means that there's always a spare in case I fuck up the numbering, which I always do at least once. Like number it and go, oh, I've just already done that number, right? And then the rest of them, I literally write promo on them. I give a box of them to the artist to give to their mates. 
I'll sell 20 promos on my Bandcamp because there's always people that want a promo copy and then the rest will be given out to press or be spares because another thing that you always have to have is every time you send out a bunch of records in the post, someone's going to say, mine got damaged, mine went missing. You always have to have a few set aside to cover the ones that disappear. Always in France. In France, the French postal service, I don't know, there's, there's like someone in France that steals records, I don't know. <laughs> With social media, it has a tendency to kind of like, it's like a platform which you, you can kind of get lost in and then realise yeah. you And then how, and then that compared to say physical going out and meeting people and handing out flyers and stuff, um, how do you, what do you kind of put more of your time into? And, and I'm definitely on social media all of the time, yeah. unfortunately. Um, but just like piecemeal, it's always open and I'm kind of going back to it and stuff. I make lists. I write out lists of things that I need to be doing and then the list gets stuck on my studio door. Things get crossed out as and when they get done, some things stay on the list for ages and ages because I never get around to doing them. We all, you know, we all know that. Social media is definitely a big time eater and it's very consu uh, time consuming, but it is also really handy to be able to be dealing, you know, sending, talking to people and chatting and promoting stuff while you're also, you know, I mean, for me in the house, I have a kid. So while I'm there and I'm feeding him his breakfast, I'm quite often then also posting up a mix that's come out the night before or something. So it's very useful for that, but nothing compares to pressing the flesh. I still try to go out to other people's club nights whenever I get a chance. I And when I do, I try to go early when the promoters are there and it's not in full swing so I can get chatting with other promoters, meet the DJs that come in. I quite often go and end up working the door not for money, but literally just to sit on the door for a bit and to see people and just to get involved with things. I always try and help out a little bit, but it's I, I find that that's where most of the lasting relationships are built, is you know literally just turning up and supporting other people's stuff. Um, did you invest much into CD? Because I yep. know it's kind of going yep. out of it. Did fucking loads of CDs. Yeah, still do CDs. No. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, I've got, uh, I've got a couple of boxes of unsold CDs. No one's interested in CDs anymore. So yeah, from my, not from my current record label, Bulk and Vinyl never did any CDs. But my previous label, Seed, which ran from 2000, 2001 to 2006, and then still ran after that. But a, a friend, of, yeah, a friend of mine, a friend of mine took over. But I've still got a box of unsold CDs from like 2004. Ah, someone, someone had to, yeah. So yeah, I think CDs are, they're, they're gone, they're dead. So, which is a shame because they were kind of handy, but you know, uh, if I'm going to do a digital release now that I'll, I'll either do just a straight up digital release and it'll be on Bandcamp and then it'll go to my digital aggregator who'll send it out to Beatport and all of those guys. Um, I did a collection of Acid tracks as the 10th anniversary of I Love Acid, the club night on a USB stick made to look like a 303, oh, that's oh. Sick, yeah. which uh, I designed and got uh, someone that did a bit of 3D modeling to render out for me and make uh, m get the mold sorted. And then I had them manufactured in China with the USB sticks inside. And to save money, I decided to uh, just get them all blank and copy the data on myself and I ended up spending every night and every passing moment sat in front of USB hubs for weeks and weeks and weeks because I didn't realize just how long it would take to copy all the data onto them because it was, it, it what was they have on them? wave files, 20 tracks of wave files. They're not USB 3. And then, no, no, they were USB 2 because, you know, I couldn't afford USB 3. So the sticks came out really well. They sold out and they were very, very popular and they were very, very cool. When I do my records, I could quite easily sell them all myself direct on Bandcamp and there'd be more money made from that but I still give them to the distributors as well to get out to shops because I think it's important to support record shops and I think that if you're sending them out to shops you're sending them out to people that are beyond your normal reach and it's helping expose the, the label further. It tends to, to build build your fan base wider. Currently, it's not well, about prefer. making the money off the record label. The record label is about building the brand. I make money off gigging, and everything else is just the work that it builds the world that that's all underneath. I still pay for a full promo radio DJ 
press still do that because I feel the artist isn't going to be making any money off it. They can at least get, the, get, the, su get the support and the exposure from it. And I think that's probably better payment. I'm sure most artists would prefer you know, a, a full range promo shoot to all the record, you know, uh, all the DJs and all the radio station stuff than enough money for a night out in the cinema. I use an agency who I really like um, because they promote very much similar labels and similar styles of music and they have really good reach and I really like the guys that, that run the PR agency. A negotiated price with them because I will release so many records and they'll know the repeat business and stuff. If you come in cold with just one release you may find your price to do a PR campaign is higher. If you have someone on a retainer because you're doing lots of things, it'll be cheaper. You really have to work out whether it's worthwhile to you by looking at the PR agency, looking at who else they represent, what reach those records seem to be getting, if they're getting to the kind of people that you want them to be. You can go for just a DJ PR package or just a radio package or just a press package or combined. And it's really something that you have to tailor to yourself, knowing what your release is and where that's going to, to land with people. I'll get the odd Radio 1 play and I'll get a few Radio 6 plays, but it's mainly things like Rinse FM and Nettle, who yeah. you love, and Balami and yeah. Radar before they close down, Represent, um, and then lots and lots of like radio shows for people across Europe and in America, and then just generally in lots of people's mixes, smaller DJs and other people that are doing their own little shows and stuff. I think they're just as important as the big shows, really, to be honest. Well, thank you very much, Josh, the Radio of Alabaster. Thank you. Thank you, guys.